Um, Minister, in September 2018, the NCSE was requested to develop policy advice on the educational provision that should be in place for students educated in special schools and classes and to make recommendations on the provision required to enable them to achieve better outcomes. Can I ask what you, when you expect the NCSE to complete and submit its policy advice on education provision in special classes and schools and if you will make a statement on the matter? Come on, Thank you, Deputy uh, Sullivan. Um, we know that uh, the then Minister for Education 2018 requested the NCSC to advise on the educational provision that should be in place for students in special schools and classes. Uh, and we know as well that Ireland is not alone in considering educational provision for students in special education settings. Many European countries uh, are thinking about the future direction that they should take. And this is particularly um, pertinent in light of the new obligations and responsibilities under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So the NCSC uh, strives to ensure that its policy advice is informed by robust and wide-ranging consultative and research processes, and its policy advice is always informed by international uh, best practice. A lot of work has been done, uh, and the NCSC published a progress report in November 2019, and at that stage, the NCSC had reviewed existing educational provision in Ireland. It had conducted a detailed literature review, it had consulted various stakeholder groups and had visited a number of Irish schools. And the NCSC has also looked uh, at fully inclusive schools and practice in Canada and Portugal. But the report ultimately found uh, that there was no evidence, uh, Deputy, to show that one type of special education placement is better than another. And it also stated that any decision to move towards greater inclusion would require careful consideration and planning. So it's not uh, something that could be achieved in the short term. But since the publication of the progress report, the NCSC has conducted further research and analysis. It has engaged in a public consultation survey, and it has also received further submissions and expert inputs and obviously, it's also examined the implications arising uh, from the, the, the United Nations Convention. But before the advice is finalised, uh, every effort is being made to ensure that the NCSC has consulted widely uh, with a view to developing shared understandings on the critical issues involved and proposed solutions. And I expect Deputy uh, to have that uh, report completed by the end of the year. I would welcome the Minister's comments, in particular that that report will be published by the end of the year, and um, that would be most welcome. Um, and just to note that what your predecessor did uh, say, um, then Minister Joe McHugh, that each child should be educated with their mainstream peers wherever feasible, and this is very much reflected in what the NCSC has stated in its progress report. Uh, Minister McHugh, uh, then Minister McHugh also said that the decision about whether to move towards greater inclusion of all students in mainstream requires very careful consideration and that this is a long-term vision that will happen gradually and by emphasising the needs of children with the most complex needs at the heart of it. And I suppose, look, as a former educator myself, uh, we can see at ground level that, you know, there is undoubtedly a shift towards greater inclusivity in, in, in all our schools, and that is most welcome. Um, and the, and that, that, that's the model shift that is occurring. Um, but obviously that brings with itself its, its own set number of challenges um, and issues. You know that there will be issues regard, regarding parents and, and students and indeed uh, educators anxiety um, and I suppose the fundamental to any shift or any change in light of that report um, supplementing schools with the appropriate resources and investment will be be a pre prerequisite thank you um, and uh, I accept your point uh, in relation to uh, the majority of children with additional needs being educated in mainstream uh, schools, which is the case, um, and obviously then there are special classes which cater for around 8,000 uh, pupils, and then also uh, the 124, almost 126 special schools that have an equal amount of children as well, and each of these educational environments uh, provide a vital service to children with additional needs, and depending on the level of complexity of need, um, they'll either be in a mainstream class, in a special cl a class, or in a special school. And you're quite right to say that if there was to be a shift, and there's no, no in, in, envisaged shift, uh, at, certainly at present, um, and if there was, it would have to be something that would be done over a long period of time. But I do believe that inclusivity is at the heart of the education system, and uh, certainly a review of the Epson Act is, is on my action, list of action priorities also.
And just to conclude, and again, I do welcome the, the Minister's comments, um, but there are obviously you know, a number of issues and challenges that would be ahead of us if there was to be any um, shift uh, in terms of our deliverability, in, in terms of delivering for, for special needs students. Um, and I suppose the challenges that I would highlight would be, you know, that it would be a phased process if it, if it needed it to happen. Um, and I suppose um, we're talking about a number of students here. I think it reflects about 2% of the, the, the school community. Um, it is a, a small minority, but at the same time, they're the minority that have, you know, the greatest need. And the issues that I find myself that are likely to come forward will be the issues and the questions we need to ask ourselves, should a four or five year old uh, child um, be put into a special setting immediately or should they be given the opportunity to interact with their peers first? Another question which arises would then, and that we need to ask ourselves is can students with the most complex of needs have those complex needs met in a mainstream environment? And these are fundamental questions we need to ask. And of course, a, a fundamental one for me is why should students have to travel 30, 40, 50 miles to an appropriate setting in the current model, and they're the, the main issues that we need to address. Thank you. Deputy, they're, they're very valid questions that you pose, um, and certainly the focus that we had in relation to the Epson Act, which, which was uh, published, which is the main legislation underpinning special education, and that act was published 17 years ago in 2004, um, and the focus in relation to the provision of special education has changed substantially from then, from a model uh, that is diagnosis-led at that point to one which is now driven by the needs of the child. Um, so I think therein lies the answer to those questions around whether a child with complex needs can fit into a mainstream school or indeed uh, the other way around. Um, and, and certainly in my view at present, there, there is a place for all these uh, special uh, class, uh, special school uh, and indeed mainstream settings um, to cater for the range of children with additional needs that we have in the system. Um, and I thank you for your interest in this matter.